Okay, hello everyone. Welcome back to Community Voices, episode 87. Super honored and excited to chat with Sarah Klein, who is an attorney and advocate for victims of sexual abuse. So thank you so much for being here, Sarah. Thank you for having me. This is great. I'm super excited to chat with you more. Um, before we kind of get into your background and everything that we're going to be talking about, I just kind of want to take a quick moment and pause and say that we will be talking about, you know, sexual abuse, um, sexual assault in this episode. So if that's triggering or hard for anyone to listen to at this time, probably pause, maybe come back later or not listen to the rest of this episode. But um, with that being said, super excited to chat with you today. Um, thank you so much for being on again. Yay! I'm excited. Let's talk. So, yes, let's talk. So most people probably know you or recognize you from the Netflix hit TV series Cheer season two. Yeah. Um, I just want to give you, yeah, I just want to give you a little second to introduce yourself. Um, tell us about yourself, your background, and kind of where you got to where you are today. Yeah, that's awesome. So. Up until 2017, 2018, I was not a public figure. I was a mom working as a lawyer and doing some business consulting stuff. I have a JD and an MBA and just sort of living my life until um, the case of Larry Nasser, former USA Gymnastics team doctor, um, serial pedophile sort of blew up and took over the national stage. And at the time I was anonymous. We went through the legal process. I was known as victim 125 up until I sort of had my coming out party live on ABC TV at the SB awards in July of 2018. Like no pressure come out as a victim of sexual abuse and do it live on national television. Right. It was crazy. And so since then, it's sort of just been one amazing sort of experience after the next in terms of being able to take my experience and help others and walk others through the legal process, which can be very arduous, very difficult. Um, and I feel like sort of having just gone through it not that many years ago um, and, and becoming public and going through everything so publicly, it's been really great to be able to pay that forward to others survivors. Yeah, that's awesome. I absolutely love how I feel like you really took something super traumatic and gave it so much purpose to your life to not only help others that have been, you know, through it, but also just prevent it from happening to others. Um, I think that's amazing. And I was a junior at Michigan State when in 2017, when the trial began with Larry Nassar, and it was just, it was so just crazy. I can't even think of a word to describe it because you think of Michigan State, it's a Big Ten school. Like there was always so much like campus pride and school spirit. And just when that trial was happening, it was like the most eerie feeling on campus. Like it was just everyone was didn't want to be there almost, you know. Yeah, it was a horrible time. And I think the reason for that was Yes, what happened was horrible, but it was the university's response and the institutional response that really made people just sort of lose that Spartan pride because you would think when an institution finds out that they've been essentially enabling and protecting a pedophile, a known serial pedophile for many years, that the right response would be, oh my God, we are so sorry. We're going to turn over for everything that we have in order to give you guys answers and you deserve the answers. And instead, we saw the opposite, which I've now come to learn in my career is pretty normal um, when institutions are confronted with cover up and enabling their first knee jerk reaction is how do we protect our brand? How do we get out of, you know, any sort of liability? And it becomes a money problem and a brand, you know, management problem instead of a child sex abuse problem, which is, is really 
upsetting and difficult, which I think is what made those years at Michigan State so screwed up. And listen, I grew up in Okemos. Like, that was my town. That was my school. We grew up wow. singing fight songs and dressing in green and white. And nobody had more love of that university than I feel like I did and my teammates who grew up there. And so... You know, we've seen it, though, across the board. People who are in love with their favorite celebrity, in love with their favorite athlete. And then we find out that there, you know, is sexual abuse occurring um, either either overtly, you know, in terms of an act by a person or being enabled by an institution we love. Um, you know, it can be really complicated and really hard to sort of hold those two things in balance, which I think is what we saw in cheer with Jerry Harris. Yeah, absolutely. And that was going to be my next question. Something I feel like so similar that happened with not only Michigan state, but USA gymnastics was also going, being swept under the rug with cheer and some major organizations there. So how did you kind of get involved with representing Sam and Charlie, who are the two twin um, boys that were on season two of Cheer, the victims of uh, Jerry Harris? How did you kind of become in contact with them or really, you know, become their attorney? And what was that like being a part of a, I guess, a case that was soon to become really public? Yeah, so it all leads back to that Indianapolis Star article in 2016, written by several amazing reporters, but one of them was named Marissa Kwiatkowski, and she, with her colleagues, amazing reporters at Indy Star, broke the Nassar story. It had been reported 16 times over the course of two decades um, and swept under the rug. Nobody paid attention. Make it go away. But she and her colleagues at the Indy, Indy Star broke the story and um, three survivors came forward. And so she, years later, moved to USA Today and was working on a story not about Jerry Harris, but about cheer at large um, and how corrupt it is and how crazy, you know, it's structured, just the culture and the structure um, of the sport, this for-profit, non-governed sport. Um, it's the wild, wild west. And so she was doing an expose on that. And Kristen, Sam and Charlie's mom, um, got in touch with, with Marissa because she had knocked on every appropriate door in order to report what had happened to her sons and she got absolutely nowhere and it took her filling out a form on fbi.gov to get anybody to listen to her and she's a perfect example of a mother who is not going to take no for an answer in order to keep her kids safe but in order to keep this predator from hurting any other kids. And so it was through Marissa Kwiatkowski that, that we came to know each other. And, you know, at the time we did know it was somewhat high profile um, because cheer season one had already been out. Monica was about to go on dancing with the stars. Um, and, and so we got involved that way, but at the time we didn't know there would be cheer season two, and we certainly didn't know, uh, that we would be featured in cheer season two. Yeah, that's, I'm really glad that y'all were featured in cheer season two and that they really did. They dived, I feel like pretty deep into that. And I felt like I had seen season one and I remember hearing the news just as it was happening, as it was coming out about Jerry and feeling like, how are they ever going to film a season two about this? Cause it's just so polar opposite. And I love that you were able to just speak on one, how hard it was for the twins mom to, you know, get someone to actually listen and do something about the reports that she was filing. But also, you know, I think you talked a lot about um, in a few episodes, just how hard it is for victims to come forward. And I mean, I can only imagine two young boys 
who are basically going out against someone who is incredibly loved by America as a whole at the time. I mean, he was a fan favorite. I just look back, he hosted some red carpet event, right? And like just crazy. Yeah. So I think that's just, you know, really important that you were able to speak to that and just how hard it is really for victims to come forward. Yeah, it's it's excruciating. And, you know, laws have traditionally been set up to be sort of more pro perpetrator than pro victim in terms of statutes of limitations and and cases criminally that actually never even see the light of day because for whatever reason, there's there's not enough um, for for the state to prove the case. So the cases never get charged. It's just really, really difficult. Um, and I I was reminded of how difficult I was an adult when I came forward. Right. And we were called, you know, sluts and whores and you asked for it and you're making it up. And what do you mean? You were 25 and you didn't know that that medical treatment wasn't sexual abuse. And we could, that's a whole other show of how well-groomed um, serial, serial predators are in order to confuse the psyche. But um, even just with cheer, I was the lawyer in this story. I wasn't the survivor and I got more online hate being called all sorts of things, which I won't repeat. Um, and all I could keep telling myself is that being that person with a voice and saying the hard things can be very triggering for people that maybe either haven't found that courage yet or they are the ones harming other people and now they're being called to the mat, right? Um, or they they know someone who's been harmed and they weren't able to protect that person. So I kept telling myself, this isn't about you, it's about them. And it's so easy to sit behind a computer screen and tear people up. But, you know, I'm 42. These boys are, are 15, 16 years old. Right. And they're in high school and they're still, you know, on cheer teams and they're still putting them, you know, selves in the cheer world, which they should be able to do because it's something they've loved and dedicated all this time to. Um, for them, it's it's I mean, you don't know what it's like until you're in it. And it's a million times harder than anybody could even imagine until you're literally walking in those shoes. Absolutely. And I, I love how you bring up that point where it's like you're, you're scrutinized, you're criticized, you're not believe and that only makes it 10 billion times harder for other victims to come forward when they're seeing someone who is in a similar situation that they're in go forward and they just get absolutely I mean, attacked on social media. I mean, I can only imagine just like the setback that that has. Yeah, the setback for them personally, but also a setback for that survivor sitting at home getting abused by their uncle, you know, who they're just maybe one victim going against an adult, right? So they're getting that messaging through watching other survivors that it's probably just easier not to say anything at all. Um, I do think the tables are turning, though. I do think with Nasser and Me Too and we're, you know, we saw this Ghislaine Maxwell um, sentencing recently in the Jeffrey Epstein case. We are seeing the tables turn, the narrative changing where it's no longer the weak thing to come forward as a survivor of sexual abuse. And I hate to say it's becoming, um, it's not becoming cooler, but it's becoming less stigmatized. It's becoming more acceptable to say, you know what? I have nothing to hide. Rip me to shreds, call me whatever you want. The truth is the truth is the truth. And I have all of these amazing people standing with me, standing beside me. And I think the boys have also felt that in a huge way. And I like to think that that's going to continue um, to progress and to build. And that's how, you know, we stop these people is to make it so uncomfortable for them to exist in a world where everybody around them is going to do the right thing and call it out instead of doing the wrong thing and enabling it and sweeping it under the rug. So with your professional experience, do you have any advice to 
parents um, of young children who, you know, are sending their kids to these activities where we do know, unfortunately, that a lot of predators put themselves in instances where they are coaches or they are teachers. You know, how do you as a parent communicate such a heavy topic to your young child who might not understand really what's going on or anything about this? Yeah, totally. So I think there's two different things going on, but my sort of ultimate premise is the responsibility should be on the adults to keep children safe. We shouldn't be placing this burden entirely on the child. With that said, there are things we can do to empower our children age appropriately. For example, my daughter is six years old and I'm teaching her anatomically correct terms. I can't stress enough how important it is to teach the words like vagina and like penis to our kids. Horrible example. A small child was going to school. Um, this is a real life case from recently. And she was saying to her teacher over and over, my daddy is eating my cookie. And the teacher was kind of laughing and didn't get it and missed the fact that that child was trying to disclose that her father was sexually abusing her. Happy ending. They finally caught on. But had that child gone to school and used the word vagina, that child would have been believed right away. They would have been in, you know, the law enforcement would have intervened right away and we could have saved that child um, a lot of, of future abuse. Um, talking about those words without any shame. So I don't teach my daughter, those are her private parts. I teach her that her vagina is a part of her body, just like her elbow. Um, we do teach boundaries though, you know, in terms of who's allowed to help her go potty, who's allowed to give her a bath, who's allowed to help her change her clothes. Um, that list is about two people. I have beautiful college babysitters that are amazing. They don't get to help her on the potty right? It's just teaching boundaries from a very young age um, and keeping that list very small. Now, in terms of what we as adults can do, funny, not funny, troubling example. My daughter's on this little pre-team for swimming. She had her first little competition where she swam, you know, across the pool once. Um, it was, it was a meet for uh, six to 12 year olds. And they said, because of COVID precautions to drop your child off at the front door and come back four hours later to pick them up and they would take care of them during the meet. My daughter's six. The other parents drop their kid off at the door because those are the rules, right? And you want to fit in. You, you want to respect the club and respect the coaches and, you know, everybody else is doing it, right? And so they're sitting there in the parking lot on their phones for four hours over my dead body. Am I letting my kid go in there? I don't care if she's six or if she's 12. She's not going in there alone. And when she's in there, I'm not taking my eyes off of her. Um, so I had to sort of fight to get in there. I had to sign up for a volunteer position and there were only so many volunteer positions that actually could have your eyes on the kid the whole time. Um, my friend told me a story about her orthodontist not letting parents in anymore because of COVID. So the parents sit in the car, big red flag. Just because everybody's doing it, don't do it. That's up to you as a parent to protect your child. Last thing I'll say, and I, I hate to be a Debbie Downer. I'm a very optimistic person. Given all the givens, I'm very, very optimistic. But um, when you're walking into your kid's school or their sports club or you know your church or whatever, you want to take a look at who is that most popular teacher, that most popular coach, the one that's going above and beyond, that's offering to give your kid a ride home, taking that special interest in your kid, you know, the one that everybody loves. They would never hurt a fly. They go above and beyond. They're always hanging out with the kids, right? I remember a, a teacher from high school that I really connected with, a male teacher, and nothing weird happened, but he was always like the cool one that all mm -hmm. the kids wanted to tell their secrets to and tell their, you know, red flag. There should not be that crossing of sort of intimate boundaries or friendship with an adult in position of authority. There's no reason your kid needs to be staying late extra, uh, doing extra practice alone with a coach. It just isn't necessary. Yeah. No, I think <laughs> all great advice. Great examples for sure. Um, so on 
next part I wanted to mention to you on your behalf, we will be donating donating five thousand dollars to a long watch home, a long walk home, sorry, um, which I know we've talked about and we love that organization. Um, they really just empower young people, young women to end that cycle and speak out about, you know, sexual abuse, domestic violence, and all things like that. And um, I know we really love how they focus on underprivileged areas who might not have those resources or that support to come forward. Um, so I'm just super excited to, you know, help them out. And, you know, I couldn't think of like a better cause. And I just absolutely love all the stories and advice you've given. I think there's just so much to learn and, um, you know, learn about this topic and continue to support one another. That's amazing. That donation is incredible. And I can't tell you, you know, I, I, I'm saying thank you as an adult, but what I really mean is I'm saying thank you as the little eight-year-old girl that I was when I was called into a back room at a gym and began being abused. Um, had there been those resources, had there been those support systems around, it might have been a very different story. So I thank you, thank you, thank you so much for giving me a voice, um, for giving Giving this topic a voice and for that donation. That's incredible. Every little bit counts. Amazing. Well, thank you so much again, Sarah. It's been seriously such an honor talking with you. You're amazing. Such a powerhouse. Um, just, yeah, a real inspiration. So I've loved getting to chat with you. Me too. Until we meet again. Thank you. Yes, so thank you. Bye. Bye.